Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So my next interview is my first interview at the Toronto International Film Festival, so it's kind of exciting for a whole host of reasons. But it's with Jennifer Abbott and Joel Backen, and we talk about their film, the new corp- their new film, The New Corporation, The Unfortunately Necessary Sequel. And I think the subtitle is very important for a whole host of reasons. Uh, it's a great film. It's, uh, it's enlightening. It is infuriating. Uh, you're going to maybe walk out of your, your, your own home theater uh, angry, hopefully... Uh, ready to step into what's next and there it comes with a call to action and so and it's entertaining it's fun it's it's fascinating and uh, you you won't believe who makes an appearance or two in this film so check it out uh, you can do that at tiff uh, you can do it online at tiff uh, and 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 uh, it's going to be coming soon to a digital theater near you i'm sure and i'm looking forward to part two with jennifer and joel i hope we can do that down the road uh, so much to talk about we barely scratched the surface on on this film we talk about social responsibility and what that actually means we talk about this existential crisis that that we find ourselves in uh, from a climate change perspective but for economically uh, as well we talk about democracy and justice we talk about opinions versus facts and denials of truth and 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 we we seem to live in the age of ridiculous assertions uh jennifer and joel talk a great deal about lifting the veil just a little bit and 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 i, I love this notion of making the familiar uh strange and maybe that you know, humans aren't actually inherently greedy. Uh, that's certainly something we talk about. And and we talk about this wonderful notion of authentic hope. And I hope that's enough for you to step into this uh, this interview, this podcast, and why the horror movies got it wrong. That's um, kind of fascinating in its own right. I'm not much of a horror film or a horror buff. Uh, love film, of course. But but uh, find out, listen into this, and more importantly, watch the film as well. So coming right up, uh, Jennifer Abbott, Joel Backen, uh, The New Corporation, the unfortunately necessary sequel, and I hope uh, a conversation that is going to keep you thinking about these issues for some time. And don't forget davidpecklive.com for more information about my writing and speaking. Uh, and and uh, you can get a copy of Real Changes Incremental there. I would love Love for you to pick one of those copies up. And also, uh, you'll find out uh, on face2facelive.ca more information about what we're up to here. So we are now into our, oh, I don't know, 523rd interview or something along those lines. And you probably got to this interview through iTunes or Spotify. So check us out there, face2facelive.ca. Leave us a review if, you, if you're if you excited or appreciate, uh, you know, what we're doing here. Uh, it, it takes about a minute, iTunes, Spotify. A little social so, social mediation goes a long way and we, we could use uh, with more reviews, always looking for more reviews. So would appreciate that. If you want to advertise with Face to Face, you can do that. Website, we've got a newsletter. Uh, don't forget to sign up for that. And uh, banners, we get a lot of hits to our website. So reach out uh, through through the website if you're interested in doing that. And, and we'd love for you to do that. But don't forget, leave that review. That's probably the most important thing you can do. You can also listen to this on YouTube. And if you're there, um, click like. That would be important. So uh, simple but important. And uh, rabble.ca, face to face appears there as well. And proud to be there uh, alongside of a whole host of other journalists and thinkers and writers and pog- uh, poggers, po- podcasters and bloggers, uh, coined a new phrase. And yeah, news for the rest of us. So, so check face to face out there as well as uh, other uh, offerings, rabble. But right now, please don't touch that dial. Stay focused and and listen in. Jennifer Abbott, Joel Backen, The New Corporation, the unfortunately necessary sequel. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We are joined by uh, two very special guests today. Really honored to have you guys on the show. Joel Backen, Jennifer Abbott here today to talk about their new film that's going to be, I believe, world premiering at the Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, Thank you to you both for joining me here today on Face to Face. It's a real pleasure. 
Thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, too. Yeah, we're delighted. Thanks, David. Joel, I got to say, though, and I mentioned it earlier, little ticked off that Noam Chomsky is not joining us for this conversation as well. <laughs> and did, did the invite just not go through or? Yeah, you know, he gets a lot of stuff in his uh, in his inbox, I assume. <laughs> I, I would I would imagine. Uh, so, so many questions. First of all, congratulations. I feel honored to be one of the first few people to have seen the film. Huge fan of the earlier film. I know there's a book, Joel. I, congrats on the film. And what a compelling, beautiful, disturbing, and necessary piece. I mean, it, it, everyone needs to see this film. Well, that's, uh, that's really good to hear. Um, we, um, we made it because we feel we're in a moment of existential crisis for the world on so many different fronts. And we thought it was not only important to uh, reveal the roots of many of the problems that we're facing, but also try to look at how we can, how we are, and how we can continue to to push back against these things and to to create a a, a world that is is decent to live in. Jennifer uh, Chris Hedges, I believe, says this is like the greatest existential crisis of our time. I'm guessing you 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 both probably agree. Did you always see this film as kind of a a political call to action, or was it more of a hey guys, this we're we're in a real mess here? Now it's up to you to help us change that. Or did you go in intentionally with, oh no, we've got this CTA at, at the end of this film that we really want to want to dial people into? Well, I think that um, it absolutely is a call to action. My work as a filmmaker is inseparable really as to my work as a media um, activist. So yes, I mean, I was actually quite reluctant to make the sequel. You know, oh. the, making the making the first film was hard enough. I, I mean, bet the, the corporation films are I call you know they're monsters. There's the scope of them, the you know what we're trying to do with them. Uh, it's they're just such huge films and really quite difficult to make. So I was quite reluctant uh, to actually embark upon the sequel, but absolutely feel it is essential at this moment in time. Things have only got worse. That's why, of course, we call it the unfortunately necessary sequel. And we face these as existential crises. And, you know, on the one hand, it's a very exciting time to be alive and actually have the privilege to try to contribute to public discourse about these absolutely urgent, urgent issues. I mean, on the other hand, it's a, it's a very difficult time and, and a, a time where a lot of us are, are feeling a lot of despair. And so, you know, we, we really wanted uh, our film to, to contribute in a val valuable way to very important public discourse. I think it's gonna do that for sure. No joke, watching the film, I have a friend who is considering going into politics. And I paused the film at a certain point. You know, we don't we don't want to give too much away, I suppose. And and I texted him and I said, "You you need to see this film. This this may change your life. If if you are undecided about what you are about to do with your life, this could be you know what's going to kind of push you over the edge in the best sense of the word." Well, that's a that's a beautiful thing to hear. And uh, you know, Jennifer and I have been over the years received so many uh, emails and comments and anecdotes about how they watched the first film, people watched the first film, and it, it caused them to, to change what they were doing, to become activated. And I have to say, you know, more than all the laurels and the, you know, positive reviews and all of that, those, those anecdotal accounts of strangers who reach out to us uh, and say your film really had an effect on my life. That that is the most uh, gratifying and and moving uh, kind of kind of responses we get. So uh, yours is your friends, and yours are are the first in on this film, and and really nice to hear. 
I, I need to tell you a quick story. Uh, I started a film club years ago, my wife and I, Elizabeth, and groups of friends, we'd get together for dinner, watch a movie, and, and have a conversation. We, we, we did that. One of the first we did was the corporation. You know, I was the one who chose that, of course. And a couple of those uh, uh, folks didn't talk to me for a while. So, so it had this, and, and this argument ensued, and this deep dialogue, and it was fascinating. And I, and I know that my friends will smile, but we had a few raging free market capitalists in the room who, who took really almost offense, you know, D did you guys, when you stepped into this uh, piece, did you have that in mind that, I don't know, trying not to polarize the issues and, and trying to say, no, this is, you know, this is a balanced overview of what's going on out there. We're trying to throw it all into the, the mix and then let the audience, I guess, be compelled and decide. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. That 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 makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think the for the first film, I had a litmus test, which was, hmm, what would my father think of this? You know, and he, he he's uh, and all I really wanted was for somebody like him not to shut down. Interesting. Other than that, though, I think that both Joel and I have a you know we have pretty strong um, belief systems around uh, democracy and justice, and we're and you know of course we are admittedly to the to the left of the spectrum but we have an absolute commitment to being rigorous in what we present to making sure that you know everything is substantiated that needs to be substantiated and that our arguments because this is an essay film right it's an right. ideas based film so it has a logical argument and just that one idea flows to the next flows to the next and so i think for me anyway that is my overriding commitment uh, and I think that if one makes a film like that, then in, it's, it's inherently not polarizing for people that have at least an open enough mind to be able to, to see it for what it is. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like the soil has to be somewhat fertile, right, before sitting down to watch this film. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think that is one of the great challenges uh, that I face as an academic, as a scholar, as as an activist, as a filmmaker, as a writer. I mean, in all these capacities today, as you face as a journalist, there's this, there's this line that we're walking between, I guess, opinion and fact. And right. it seems facts are so overwhelmingly in support of the perspectives that we're advancing. And the denials of truth and the false news seem to be on the other side. I mean, you know, to deny climate change today is a ridiculous assertion. To say that democracy is working is a ridiculous assertion. To say that we live in a world that is racially just is a ridiculous assertion. So these things are just factually incorrect. And I would add to say that markets and corporations are going to take us towards uh, a new and better world is a ridiculous assertion. All of these statements are factual, in my view, and can be backed up with the most rigorous, factual, and analytical, scholarly arguments. And that's what we try to do in the film. We, we're not uh, you know, out there on a kind of opinion ledge saying, oh, this is what we believe, and if you don't believe us, forget it. And so as Jen was saying, I mean, her father's a litmus test. I have many people in my family and my life who are the litmus test. And, and what you wanna say is, look, let's get a conversation going. Let's get a conversation going with the executive of a big corporation and say, do you really believe that what you're doing and how you're acting is going to make a better world, is going to make a more democratic world, is going to make a more just world? And maybe you do, and but let's have that discussion. Let's not just sit in our kind of presumptive uh, silos and 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 not interrogate things. So, so I think we wanted to make a film that would disturb people's thinking processes, shock, uh, shock them out of their complacency. Would shock them out of their complacency, but not in a way that was yelling at them, but right. in, in a way that was presenting an argument. And that is ultimately what this film is. It's an argument and hopefully a persuasive one. But there's always another side to an argument. And I'm really happy if all we do is get those arguments going. I, um, I love the B-roll shot you have of Milton Friedman. What would he have thought of this, uh, of this film? 
<laughs> he would have agreed with a lot of it. Um, I, I mean, well, not a lot of it. He would have agreed with our critique of corporate social responsibility. And we haven't been the first film basically saying corporations aren't made to be socially responsible. Uh, after mm -hmm. that, we might have parted ways. <laughs> I mean, on the other hand, it would be really interesting to to know what he might think now. Like, is he an Alan Greenspan that would admit, oh, sure. there may be a fly, a flaw, you know, here, um, because things have become so extreme. So, well, I this massive that... sweeping generalization that that the burgeoning middle class is going to lift all boats. You you don't have to travel too far. And thankfully, I've had the privilege because of my work in international development to, to travel to many countries. Cambodia is one of my favorite places in the world. My wife introduced me to, to Southeast Asia back in uh, 2000. And um, yeah, you, you don't have to travel too far to see that these types of assumptions are, are pretty easily uh, easy to question. Right, they they they, you know, you talk about rigor, you talk about fact. You don't you don't have to go too deep to say, well, hang on, what middle class? Well, I think that really it is easy to see so many of the, it it is easy to see the injustices, if one can lift the veil just right. a little bit, right? And I mean, coincidentally, Joel and I have. You could correct me if I misrepresent this, um, Joel, but. We both, before we even started working together, one of the focuses of both our work, but in very different ways, was to make the familiar strange, mm. to de to de reify social practices or social customs, and so I think that's like when one can present uh, norms, so called norms, in ways that shine a, a different light on them, which shows their social construction, that gives a lot of hope. Because if the institution of the corporation is a social construct, well, it can be constructed differently. Or the, you know, all of these things can be constructed differently because they're human construction. So uh, I just, um, yes, that's just been a, a real focus of our work and something that I've been working with for many, many years now. Mm -hmm. Question: All of these questions are to to both of you. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, greed is you know, um, greed is good. You know, Gordon Gecko's line out of Oliver Stone's film. What are we going to do about greed? And at what point it, it, is enough enough? I remember responding to somebody, uh, a friend of mine, who I would call a raving free market capitalist, and every S that was in. You know, I hope you both appreciate this, but in every S, I used the dollar sign when I was responding to this guy. And of course, ha ha, I got the, the joke was well taken, et cetera. But at what point the, 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 the tone of that note was, when is enough enough? And is that really kind of the underlying problem here? Uh, I want my $300 pair of running shoes, therefore we have a problem. Or, or whatever the case might be. I want a 3,000 uh, 3, square foot home, et cetera, et cetera. Either of you have some thoughts on that? Where does the responsibility, I guess, lie with me, I suppose? Well, I, I don't think most of us as human beings are inherently greedy. I think it's one of the conceits of the right uh, that as human, our human nature is inherently self-interested. I don't think that's true. I mean, the common experience shows that, you know, we care, uh, we were compassionate, we're incredibly complex beings. And no doubt self-interest, even greed is part of that complex. But what we've done with our current corporate capitalist system is we've said that that aspect of ourselves is the primary aspect right. of, our, of who we are. And not only that, but therefore, since that's the primary aspect of who we are, we have to create social and economic structures that serve that and only that. And, and so we create the corporation as a legally required to be self-interested entity. We then create our politics around that to serve its needs. And all the way down, we're saying, and ultimately that's because we are inherently greedy, self-interested people. Um, so I think our challenge has to begin with understanding that we're actually not those people that we're actually much more complex, that we actually have incredible capacity and need 
for collective engagement, for social engagement, for love, for compassion, for beauty, for all of the, for education, for enlightenment, for all of these things that make us human, for caring about other beings on the earth who aren't human, animals, for caring about the environment, for enjoying being uh, sitting next to a beautiful stream and looking out at the ocean. All of these poetic things that define our humanity get subsumed into this idea of greed that are part of this corporate capitalist story. So we have to see ourselves as, as who we really are. And then the next step is we need to build institutions and social structures that give effect to that rather than this much more narrow conception of ourselves as greedy. So when you talk about, oh, you know, I want the $300 uh, sneakers, the, the task isn't for you to say, oh, I have to be less greedy. I shouldn't covet those $300 sneakers. The task is for us collectively to understand, okay, that's part of who we are. Sometimes we want that, but are we willing to trade that off for destroying the planet, for example? I don't think so if we're given that choice. So let's try to understand the complexity of who we are, and let's try to actually create social and economic institutions that reflect that. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to add that in, I agree so much with everything Joel is saying. And in our film, uh, we do have a COVID-19 section. And I think uh, that people's community and communal spirit related to COVID and how communities and have responded to this emergency shows that we crave connection, you know, we crave meaning. We, we use one headline in the film, the, the, the horror movies got it wrong. You know, <laughs> right. we, you know we're, we, yeah. people have come, stepped up and they're helping each other and they're there for each other, right? And at the same time, it's laid bare the injustices of the system. And I think people are really seeing through this crisis, the vacuousness of a life that is centered around individual just the, the glorification of the individual. So it feels to me like there's a, a, a quite a widespread shift and consciousness around just how flawed uh, the primacy of individualism in our society is. So, so what I'm hearing you say, Jennifer, and help me out here, but it, it's about the other. It's about community. We similarity through difference. Not not. This isn't about polarization. This isn't about. Okay, sorry for going cliche. This isn't about building fences and walls. This is actually right. about embracing and welcoming other people in. And not only other people, but also non-human animals. Right. Also, right, of course, the, yeah. the planet. The, because, the planet. You know, the planet. And I think that that is also what what climate change is teaching us. Yes. Right. And so it's not only about humans it's a it's about our non-human animal brothers and sisters and it's about the planet so and i think a lot of people are really understanding that is is the word prosperity better than profit does that does that distinction mean anything to either of you would you say uh, is I there a, the word i prefer the word humanity mm, i mean all these words nice. are are quite um uh you know indeterminate sure 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 well i was joel i was thinking you know people planet profit right sort of the yeah. three p's which lots of yeah. people campaign on right i would just stop at people and planet nice in 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 the sense that obviously we want to create an economy that serves people uh maybe i would say people planet and community or right. people planet nice. and society uh, so as people as individuals, people in community and the planet. I mean, we've we've really turned on, uh, you know, and, and this is what corporate capitalism does. It creates the economy as the end rather than the means. Right. Um, it creates it. It creates this thing called the economy that becomes like this animal that we have to feed. And 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 we are its servants. We have to give it our labor. We have to give it our money as consumers. We have to ensure that it's not taxed too heavily or it might die. And so it becomes this kind of living thing that we have to serve. And that is absolutely ridiculous and bizarre. If you just step back a little bit, 
you know, it gets back to what Jem was saying about, you know, making the normal seem strange. Right. Our normal thing is we talk about the economy with a capital E and what, how it's doing and is it okay and is it doing this and is it doing that? When what we should be thinking about is, are we doing okay? And and our our relation, our economic relations of supply and services and the stuff that we need to, to live good lives, whether it's education or it's running shoes or whatever, is that happening in such a way that it's best serving people, planet, and society? So I think I would just take out prosperity and profit because they're these kind of economic values that feel detached in a way from the end, which is us as humanity, our planet and nature. I love, I love the means and ends thing. And I think, I think it, it makes a, well, ha- look at what the world has justified. You don't have to go too, too far back into history, right? To see what, I mean, I've, I've focused my life, my world uh, to some degree academically and uh, making a bit of a film myself about Cambodia. And when you look at this hyper communism, that, that that the extreme of that what what you know an idea right uh, so so we i i was raised believing there was no such thing as a free lunch well you know what maybe actually there's a whole lot of free lunches out there you know and 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 maybe it's worth and, and this is what i so love about the film and, and this conversation we're having now i want to hope that that even the most cynical in the room is going to be open to to, to that kind of a question well i you know, I, it's interesting because, of course, when we were making the film, we think about who our audience is. Of course, yeah. And, you know, I think every filmmaker perhaps wants, oh, we want everyone to see it. Right, right. Right. But, you know, I think the sad truth is right now there is so much polarization and there is substantiation, right, of these conspiracy theories and, you know, engaging with people who are committed to those narratives is sometimes feels quite futile. So, uh, you know, of course, we would hope everybody would be open, but I don't think I'm so naive to think that they would be. That said, it was very interesting making the film now as opposed to the first one, because we did feel we could really question capitalism as a system. You know, we, we do that quite overtly and we didn't do that in the first film. And I think today there are more people who will be quite receptive to the ideas of the film and to challenging what were, were considered, you know, unchallengeable even three years ago or even five, you know. So I, I, think, it, I think there's actually quite a broad audience for this film but not everybody will be open to it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, would, I would add to that, I would add to that, that um, we, I think quite consciously try to give people a sense of what they can do within the current system. In sure. other words, we, we, don't, we don't kind of get two thirds of the way through the film and then say, you know, we just have to tear it all down and have revolutions. And we actually don't advocate that um, we we say how can we take the institutions that we have and actually make them work how can we protest how can we engage in activism of all different kinds how can we actually recraft and remake the democratic institutions that govern us so i think it the film is is unique in today's space in not ending by saying, you know, we're screwed and we either have to just become cynical and go into our little holes or we have to tear down the whole system and start again. We really try to find a place where a person can walk out of the theater, I was going to say, where a right. person can walk out of the room that they're watching. Of their in. Zoom call. Yes, yes, their, their, their digital theater. And, That's right. And get on a Zoom meeting. And, and, and actually feel that they can begin to be involved in changing the world. Joel, Jennifer, did, did you end the film essentially with, with a, was it William Barber who said people, people protest what they believe can be changed? Was that, mm-hmm. was that the direct quote? I mean, what a beautiful, I mean, what I love about your film is some could walk away, ha- let's say people shut it down halfway. Wow, that's a cynical negative piece, right? But you so don't 
don't take us there. You take us to action. You take us, well, Chris Hedges, find a way to resist, basically. So now let's have a conversation about what it means to resist. And, and I so love William Barber's comment about protest what you can, we, we protest what we can change. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, uh, Reverend uh, William Barber is really one of my heroes. And <laughs> nice. I, 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 I'm true. I, I'm not Christian, but I actually watch his services on Sunday. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, you know what? It's interesting. He's got a bit of, he's got a bit of Cornell West in him for sure. I, he does I, have I, some I, Cornell yeah, West yeah, in him. Yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely. He does. Uh, and I think, you know, when we talk about action, you know, in some, we, in some ways it was very fortuitous that we hadn't finished the film before the George Floyd uprising. Because previous iterations, you know, if, if I'm gonna be completely honest, the endings, they didn't feel substantial enough. They, mm. you know, we set up this, you know, the, the behemoth that we are facing with all right. these crises, so big, so powerful. And, you know, even though there's so many people all over the world working so hard to change things, until the George Floyd uprising, which in such a short period of time challenged systemic racism and tore down you know, parts of the system. Um, until that happened, for me anyway, I, I just felt the ending didn't, it, it didn't have enough authentic hope. Like, right, hmm. we needed to present That's authentic good. hope. So, so for me, um, the George Floyd uprising is so hopeful in terms of how we can challenge the system and change things in a relatively short period of time. So, you know, as I say, it was really um, fortuitous that we hadn't completed the film before that happened and we were able to include it. I love the notion of authentic hope. It's a beautiful title for a, a book I think you might be writing soon, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe Joel can help you find a publisher. I, I don't know if I have a book. I think I might have a little pamphlet. <laughs> or the next film. Yeah. Or, 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 next film. or your next film. Socialism for the rich. I just honestly, so is that really greenwashing in a way? Is yeah, that, I is, mean, that's a term that George Bernard Shaw yeah. or, uh, coined and uh, in our film Robert Reich picks it up that's socialism right. for the rich capitalism for the who poor. also says who also says quite definitively there's no such thing as corporate social responsibility exactly exactly I mean Robert Reich speaks his mind which yes. is great um, but socialism for the rich capitalism for the poor it's um, it, it's a it's a ter it's a phrase I've used in some of my academic writing because it so beautifully captures the idea that um, state power is, you know, the, 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 the right and conservatives and, and economic liberals always talk about, oh, we want a minimal state. We don't want the state to do this. We don't want the state to do that. It should just confine itself, blah, blah, blah. But what does the state do? The state defines and enforces property rights. The state creates and enforces corporations. The state creates and enables markets by creating contract rights. The state creates currency. The state basically creates, enforces, and allows corporate capitalism to function. Uh, if protesters go or if strikers go to the gates of a corporation, the state will send police to deal with that if they trespass on their... So, so socialism for the rich is this idea that corporations and the rich benefit greatly from the power of the state, from government intervention, exactly the, the same thing that they say, oh, that's a bad thing, but then they're you know benefiting from it greatly. In the meantime, the poor actually are living a life of capitalism. They get no state intervention. The state is pulling back funding of schools. The state's pulling back funding of welfare. The state's pulling back funding of, in, of enforcing environmental regulations. So in all the social and environmental domains, capitalism reigns. The state says, we're not gonna do that. But for the rich and for corporations, the state is there doing their bidding. And so that's really what is captured in that wonderful phrase. The um, the charade of of uh, the what was it the elite the charade of changing the world um, the mm -hmm. the book winner takes all and I, I can't remember the name mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to be uh, going to be diving into that yeah. but 
but and I guess that's what I meant about the, the and that's really helpful, but the the connection to that sort of that greenwashing idea. And that would be not non-authentic hope, it seems to me, right? Like there's some kind of hope in that, I suppose, uh, to your point, Jennifer, but but the inauthenticity of that is really at the, again, we're back to the end, aren't we? Treat, treating people like commodities. That's what the end is. It's not about the community. It's not about the polis, which is sort of where you guys go with us, which I think, again, is, is wonderful. Jennifer, really fascinating. So 2003, um, the book, Joel, 17, what are we, 17 years later, I guess you guys started filming a few years yeah. ago. How much has changed? How much has stayed the same? Obviously, you guys are still, I mean, this is a hopeful film. And again, I hope everyone's going to see it, and I'm going to do my best to make sure I, I get a few people on board. But um, yeah, what? Seventeen years is a long time. What? Uh, what's? Hmm, what's? What's different today? Well, I, I, I mean, I think one of the biggest differences is our ineffectiveness in addressing climate change the last seventeen years, hmm. and that really were. Sadly, we, we're kind of over the cliff. It's, it's really too late to, to stop climate change. We're at a point now where hopefully we can lessen the more catastrophic predictions. Right. So, you know, I think that is a very, very difficult place to be because it's, it, is a, it, is, it is human created, but now it's no longer in human control to some degree. Right. I mean, we still have agency. I'm not saying that we should give up. I'm just saying there's certain things we've lost 17 years later. Right. So I think that's that's a very difficult place to be. And of course, we face other existential crises, too. But those we have more control over. So, you know, um, and it's called the unfortunately necessary sequel because we we didn't want to make the film. We, <laughs> we wish things weren't as bad as right. they are. Yes. But I think very few people would, would feel otherwise. My sense is most people feel the world is a mess. And of course, we're in the midst of a global pandemic, which is in part human caused as well. We, we touch on that. Uh, and so... It's, I think it's a very, very difficult time for a lot of people, more difficult than 17 years ago. I can speak for myself. Making that film, I thought, oh, if we, you know, I thought we still had time to, to turn things around. And again, I'm not saying we should give up. I'm just saying it's a new world. It's a new planet. And, you know, as we go forward, uh, there are less options available to sure. us. Mm -hmm. I sadly we're going to have to wrap it up. I know I think both of you have other interviews coming up and I'm frankly a little pissed off about that, but uh <laughs> I I will cope. So we may have to do a we may have to do a part 2, but uh to. Yeah, I I you know, I love the way you know, 17 years later, you you give us these really great solutions at the end and these solutions are people. These are people who made choices, who took responsibility, who said, I can make a difference in my worldview or in my space, and actually went on to do some pretty cool, amazing, incredible things. And I think that's an affirmation and a challenge to us all, it seems to me. And, and I think it's really, it's authentically hopeful, you know, and, and I love that. Um, what we've got a couple minutes, Joel, Jennifer, what's, what's next? Is it get this out there? I, Oh, by the way, I signed up for the newsletter already on the website. So I'm going to encourage everyone else to do that as well. I'll be pushing this through on social media. Please leave us a review by the way on iTunes, if you can. Um, but what is next? I mean, obviously is, is there, uh, you're, you're probably thinking to yourself, there's no way you're going to make a part three. I think, um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, the, the immediate thing is to uh, get a little bit of rest and relaxation, <laughs> to be right. honest. I mean, I, I've been on this project since 2014. Wow. Um, and uh, the book and the film. And, and so, you know, I, I don't want to jump into another one until maybe next week or the week after. I need a little <laughs> rest. Um, and, and, you know, I, I mean... It's a lot of a uh, lot of work 
right now for both the book and the film doing these kinds of interviews. And it's great. It's really fun to just get out and start engaging with people because it's a very, in some ways, insular process when right, you're making a project, you're just kind of in it for, it's so intense. And so now to be talking to you about it, to be having people viewing it, reading the book, all of that, it's just a real, a real thrill. And out of that usually comes, begins to come ideas about what the next project about, about what is. next is. Yeah, that's so good, yeah. which is a testament to conversation and dialogue and why this stuff Absolutely. matters in the first place and why I started face to face a few years back. Um, wow, thank you so much. What a, oh. what a privilege to have you both on. Thank you for the film. It's, it's beautiful, it's compelling, it's important. And, and, and like I said, every, everyone needs to see it. And uh, we, we've been talking with uh, Joel Backen and Jennifer Abbott here today on Face to Face. What a, what a pleasure having you both with us can, today. Can I just actually oh, interject yes. one thing? Sorry, yeah. I really no, no, go. feel that I, that I want to say this. Uh, you want a book part this? two right now? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, oh, but part two of this, series, that would be possible. No, I really just wanted to acknowledge um, our collaborators. Oh, yeah. This was a this was a huge team um, project. And an editor is so in, in a documentary like this is just so vital. And I, I really want to put, uh, give a shout out to Peter Rowick who okay. did a superb, superb job editing and really just went the extra mile. And, and Joel and I consider one of our, you know, a, a, an equal collaborator. Nice. And also to Matt Robertson, who's the composer and Velcro Ripper, who did the sound design. And I can't help but also um, acknowledge, of course, our producers, uh, Betsy Carson and Trish Dolman. Amazing. So really, I just wanted to, um, to give a, a, a shout out to our team. Fantastic. And I'll make sure I do that as well. Again, thank you. What a, what a pleasure having you both on today. Thanks so much. Thanks so thank much. You. Bye -bye, thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank you.